Whether it's a loving romance or a devastating war, we all know what it's like to get caught up in something bigger than ourselves. Maybe you go back and forth trying to carry everyone's burdens all the while losing touch with your own humanity. How do we find the strength to keep going? How do we not give in to feelings of hatred and nihilism? On today's episode of the Live a Meaningful Story podcast, we'll explore a layered and magical fantasy about appearances, forging a new kind of family, and finding strength through compassion in times of war. Howl's Moving Castle is a film adaptation by legendary anime director Hayao Miyazaki. 20 years after its release, it maintains a polarizing position in Studio Ghibli's filmography, with some hailing it as a layered masterpiece, while others think of it as a gorgeous yet convoluted mess. But within these archetypes contain ideas ranging from vanity to passivism that are relevant for our world today. But at the heart of this tale is a journey towards giving your heart to someone else, no matter how heavy it might be to bear. And how if you love others above yourself, you can do great things, even when the world around you is falling apart. Welcome to the Live a Meaningful Story podcast, where we analyze stories and films that help us make sense of life. We are four friends with backgrounds in storytelling, filmmaking, teaching, and narrative therapy. Join us on our quest towards telling and living our stories more meaningfully. I'm Derek Hatch. My name is Nick Nita. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm Joseph Wilson. I'm Jason Lin. All right. So we are doing our final episode in this series on acceptance, and we've done the romance of past lives. We've done the war in fury, and now we're bringing them together. And I remember us texting and being like, how is Howl's Moving Castle going to fit into this? And I'm like, oh boy, it does. It literally will tie these things in together. I did not realize that until very, very recently. Yeah. So it's a good pairing. So unfortunately, you guys will notice that Joe is not here for this episode. He will be back, obviously, on the next one. He hates this movie. So he said, no, we didn't. Get, we didn't get his opinion. Lies, lies. No, he, he gave me his opinion. He loved it. He loved it? Oh, man, that's a bummer. That he couldn't be here then. Yeah. Tori and I did two episodes on Studio Ghibli in when it was the All Things Narrative podcast. But this is the first time that us, that we've described a Studio Ghibli film. So mm. this is going to be really interesting. So let's go ahead and dive into it. I'll start with the letterbox description. When Sophie, a shy young woman, is cursed with an old body by a spiteful witch... Her only chance of breaking the spell lies with a self-indulgent yet insecure young wizard and his companions in a legged walking castle. So, Miyazaki, we saw The Boy and the Heron in theaters. And what did you guys think of that one? Fun. I thought it was cool. That was your first There's one. a lot going on. That was a messier movie than this one. So as yep. I was watching this one, I was thinking of The Boy and the Heron and I liked The Boy and the Heron better. Yeah. Sorry, what word are you saying? Herod, Heron. Heron? 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 <laughs> Heron? I don't know. The boy and the bird. <laughs> the boy and the bird. So then that was your first one. Yeah. And then you saw this and Spirited Away, right? Yeah, I'm three in now. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Miyazaki and him making this film because the backstory of all this is quite interesting of how this film even came to be. We, we know that Miyazaki, this theme of war is very close to his heart. So when he was three years old, him and his family fled. This is like early 1940s here. There was a firebomb that was destroying their village, kind of like the scene in The Boy and the Heron. And there was somebody that was running and it was a mother and her child. And they were crying out and asking for the, it was like some kind of like cargo truck or something like that they were on. And they were full. They didn't have any more room. And this mother and the child were chasing the vehicle, trying to catch up and, and begging for it to stop. And they just kept going. And so that moment has always haunted him for that, even though he was only three years old. We fast forward to 2003, and the next film they're making is House Moving Castle, which originally he was not even supposed to be the director for. It was another director. But he has this habit of taking over projects when he thinks he can do them better than whoever's there. <laughs> So this is another case of that. But really what really made him want to take on this project was when America got involved in the Middle East and the Iraq War. Something he was so opposed to that he did not accept his Academy Award for Spirited Away when he won it because he was that opposed to what America was doing. 
With Howl's Moving Castle, he's, he makes a shift in his career where he says, I'm no longer going to try to make films that appeal to a Western audience. I want to make things that are more layered, more complex. And it's interesting because he has on record said that this is his favorite film that he's ever made. Didn't say it was his best film, mm -hmm. but he said this is his personal favorite. So what were your guys' initial thoughts as you were seeing it? Well, the first time I watched it, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed The Castle. Yeah. I thought Hal was a funny character. I thought the group of characters were really fun. That little family of outcasts, uh -huh. the turnip head, <laughs> Michael. Yeah. The little boy uh, who, who puts the hood over and pretends to be yeah, the yeah. long man. beard. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of calcifer. It's just a bunch of craziness, yeah. which is what I like. Yeah, but this is the best cast of characters, I think, in any Ghibli film. I had a different experience the second time I watched it. The second uh -huh. time it felt a little slower and longer. Yeah. And so right before we were talking about Eastern and Western filmmaking, so I'm really interested to to discover that. Yeah. Because the second time was a different experience. It, it went down a little bit for me. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, it, was it just the pacing or was there other reasons it went down? So I don't mind slow movies. I like slow movies. but. There's something about this that is kind of like, the word I was using was sleepy. It mm -hmm. was just a very different kind of vibe. Right. In the, it may have to do with the Eastern mm -hmm. filmmaking, but there was not a lot of momentum. And my experience with a lot of Studio Ghibli films is the visuals are overwhelming to me. Mm -hmm. There's so much happening mm -hmm. that it's hard for me to get excited, I think super busy so much going on and there's a lot that doesn't get explained in, in a lot of the a lot of this guy's movies there's a good and bad but yeah it, it, i don't mind just like crazy silliness mm -hmm. and there's a lot to how that i that that's there that i like yeah yeah watching this the second time was really more of the first time because i had seen it's basically all i had known were impressions of how the movie had felt or what i remembered seeing just the characters the Scarecrow kind of hopping around. Yeah, turnip head. But there was a lot of things that I, most of the whole movie I experienced for the first time and it was new. And I really enjoyed Sophie as a character. Yeah. Sophie is awesome. I think it's one of his best protagonists. Yeah, I, th I think she's one of the strongest and, and the least subtle. And I think mm -hmm. uh, that's, I liked it that way. And there's a lot going on in this one. It's not just one concept. And I think that's in a lot of his movies. There's, yeah. There's, it's a multifaceted story and, and life's like that, but there's, there's greed. There's the concept of giving your heart to someone else or, mm -hmm. or, or the weight of your own heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's appearance, beauty, mm -hmm. things that you can't change. I liked how the, the magic and the wizards and stuff was yeah. not like a, a surprise in this movie and that's what caught me off guard. Yeah. They're like, oh, she floated down from the onto the balcony. Yeah, it just accepts that magic's part of this. Yeah. World. It's like, oh, this this these things just happen. Mm -hmm. But there's just a lot of cool themes and I really like and I really see the concept of flight. After this movie, I agree with you. He's either fascinated, terrified, or just completely <laughs> like both about Birds. Oh yeah. They're Wait till I get to the bird part. Dude, the cane is a bird. Uh huh. The yep. the hat that she comes in, that her mom comes uh -huh. in with, is like a big bird on it. Mm -hmm. How is the turns into a bird. Yeah. The monster, like the wizards that turn themselves into monsters that fly around, they're, they're like fro frogs with wings. Yeah. They like flight is is a terrifying concept and it's a freeing concept. Yep. And then freedom is another big theme in this. But this right. that's just kind of the general impressions. But a breathtakingly beautiful movie, like the meadow, the yeah. I just think that there's there. He's really good at showing these beautiful, like yeah. sprawling, glittering scenes, and also just a perversion. Yeah, like the castle itself is ugly. Right. How's um? It's just this patchwork of pieces yeah. that are situated, and that's yeah. a metaphor, kind of like Fury, right? Fury, rep, the tank represents the family and each role they play. Mm -hmm. The castle likewise represents this new family coming together, this patchwork. And then when the castle falls apart later, the family is at risk of falling apart mm -hmm. and they have to figure out how to mend it back. Mm -hmm. It's it's also a, a, a reflection of how in his mental state. Yes, and yes. I've thought about... Okay, he, he's he's the, the war daddy of the castle. Yeah. So 
I thought about that the whole tantrum about his beauty, and I saw something online that I thought was interesting. So I'm kind of drawn from that too. Yeah. But he is n- deeply depressed. Yeah. And there is a a deep hollowness, and I th- you know most if not all of the past few movies we've done, Fury and Past Lives, Past Lives. Mm-hmm. But Hal is just running. He's just running the whole time. Yeah. He can make himself beautiful, and on the on the outside, he seems beautiful. Right. But yeah, he's, he's slowly very... becoming more of a monster. His life is a mess. Right. Markle is, even tells us, oh, I can't remember the last time I had an actual breakfast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And all these things are being hinted at. And when he loses the one thing he has control over, it's all, it's all gone. Yeah. And I thought the way that was depicted, uh, I've got a lot of thoughts. We'll probably get yeah, to let's, them, let's go my, through. That's just my first. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a good start rant. there. I'll kind of go into the stuff about Eastern storytelling and then that'll help us take it, you know, through oh, you the. you do have that. Nice. Let's go through the film. Yeah. Oh, I see Calcifer is the first name I saw. On Calcifer you. on my notes. Oh my gosh. Calcifer, is, Calcifer is the heart of the film in a way. Literally. Um, literally. 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 <laughs> I understand why your daughters like him. They haven't even seen this movie, but what? they, they just have? love Calcifer. Oh, on the on the screen, they love mm-hmm. seeing. Yeah, that's funny. But so there's two key things in Japanese and Eastern storytelling in general that differentiate from West. Now, just keep in mind when I say Western storytelling, I'm talking about traditional Western story. No subversions, no postmodern twists. Like just traditional Western storytelling that tends to either be a three act structure or a five act structure. I didn't know there was five. Yeah, usually you see that more in novels, like in Shakespeare and more okay. long-form form storytelling. <laughs> there are certain, like Tarantino uses a five-act structure, so certain filmmakers do it. But in Japan and in the East, it's a four-act structure. So there's two big differences. So one is that Western stories tend to emphasize overcoming external conflict. So internal conflict is worked out so that the larger external conflict can get worked out. In the East, it's reversed. So the primary conflict in an Eastern story tends to be internal in nature. So you have to ask, what is the internal conflict? And the externals are just meant to kind of pull out sh- it. pull it out internal. in different ways. That's like past lives. Yeah, so Past Lives actually very much does use a more Eastern compared to a Western, at least in my opinion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it uses a three act structure, but it does it yeah, emphasizes yeah, but it emphasizes that more. So, like in Howl's Movie Castle, the central conflict is Sophie's curse. Now, that you might think that that's an external thing that's placed on her, but actually, in a minute when we get into it, it actually is an internal thing that what the witch did brought out of her. And it's something that she has to deal with. The second major difference is the storytelling structure itself. And this might explain the pacing for you. Typically tends to be four acts. So the first act is called the key or the Kai. I don't know how to pronounce it. (laughs) It's been a while since I've read this stuff. But basically, this is all very much similar to the first act in the West. You introduce your setting, your characters, your inciting incident, right? Pretty much the same there. Now, the introductions can be longer, they can be shorter, but what's different is the second act. The second act is called the show, and the show is is also called development. So it takes everything in the first act and just develops it further. That's all it does. So it develops the characters more, it develops the setting more, it helps you understand the situation better. So this kind of is that lull that you might feel because the development tends to be the longest act. Mm -hmm. I mean, Miyazaki can do an act two that's an hour where you're just in this place of just developing things, right? Then the last two acts come really quick. There's the 10, which introduces some sort of twist. So the twist comes later. And so the twist in Howl's at least from what I understand it, is all the stuff when we get to the heart and we get to this weird time travel sequence, right? And the movie starts to go, oh, like, where's Hal's heart? What role is Sophie meant to play? That's the twist. So if the act two, the development, begins with Sophie getting the curse, becoming old, and then it doesn't end until that sequence where the castle is going to be destroyed and she that 
Think of how long of them mm-hmm. that is in the movie, right? Where all we're doing is developing. We're just developing characters. <clears throat> we're just, right? And then there's the twist. This is where the conflict, the internal conflict is solved. And then the last part is the ketsu. And that's basically where we kind of revisit things in the beginning, but now we see a new status quo move forward. So in The Boy and the Heron, the last act is one minute. I'm pretty sure. One minute for the last act. In the three act structures, it's inciting incident, first act, climax. Rising inci- action, yeah. climax, falling action, same for the, resolution. Same for the second act and the third act, right? So those are the five, like for the five acts there. And then the three acts basically put those together in different ways. But like our resolutions tend to be a good like 10 minutes ish in a movie, right? Where you have all the height of the the problem, but then we kind of get some breathing room to kind of, right? In a lot of these Miyazaki films, it's really quick. Oh, she calls the war off. Oh, I guess we'll just call this silly war off. They're flying in the sky in the castle. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. They're very quick resolutions. So yes, that, does that, that kind of explain a bit more yeah, like the, the structure? So if we move through this story, if we move through Howl's, it's interesting because like, let's see how some of these themes play out here. So you, you start off with this dialogue that's basically all gossip and rumors about how, like Howl. who is this Howl figure? Howl's hearts. Yeah. And it's already made like you're starting off with propaganda and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, cause you're introducing this war theme through like you're just smothered with propaganda in the first few minutes the parade outside and sophie's just trying to stay in her own little corner trying to catch. she's yeah she's trying to just kind of stay away from from all that stuff but she's going to get sucked into the war whether she realizes it or not kind of like norman in fury she's going to get sucked in so when she meets howl they have that awesome sequence where they're walking in the sky right that moment where she's with Howl and she's in, she starts to see things that she couldn't see before. So there's like a spiritual, magical reality that opens up for her that maybe she was oblivious to before. But that also opens her up to both the enchantments of Howl, but also the Witch of the Waste, right? It opens her up to the potential of darkness to enter as well. And the Witch of the Waste is jealous because she wants Howl's heart. Because we learn later that she has a curse too, where she's holding back a curse, I should say, because she's really old, but she's trying to mask herself with beauty to look young. And that's kind of what Hal struggles with, except Hal really is young. Mm -hmm. And, but so she wants to possess that youthfulness. And so she wants to take that and she sees Sophie as a threat to that already in the first 10, 15 minutes, we're in this fantasy world but yet there's so many ideas in the real world that it's it's grounded in, you know? There's so many things that my mind goes to that when we think of, it's not just escapism, it's actually meant to help us engage more, our world. Yeah, yeah. More with reality. Exactly. So then we get to the, the long development here, right? We come into this world and we're, we just try to make the best of it. And so Sophie gets this curse and she's old and she kind of just, takes it in stride. She doesn't really like try to fight it or she, she just kind of accepts it. And that's kind of where some of the comedy comes. I think this is his funniest movie. Well, what I thought was funny, and this is my take on it is that her mm-hmm. personality mm-hmm. didn't necessarily change. Her mind didn't. It was almost an outlet to express herself actually. Yeah. Cause she has that line where she says like, Oh, now my, doesn't she have a line? Now I dress like, finally now suits me. Now I dress me. finally suits me. Yes. And so she, she's witty. She is bold. And and the the thing about her own beauty had hung her up. And I wonder if, you know, her becoming old, it was just like, well, whatever, fine. I don't even yeah. have to worry about this anymore. And she just charged into the wilds. Well, because even. Because it's like, all right, what? Oh, I don't, I wouldn't go out there if I were you. All right, thanks. I'll keep it in mind. Yeah. She just goes and. Well, even her name is an old soul kind of name because yeah. Sophie literally means wisdom, right? It's where we get oh, the, the word for wisdom there. That. So, is, like her having the gray hair, right? Yes. Like, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. That's that. It. She actually embodies her name more when she's older. Well, actually, we'll see that there's yeah. a way that her two identities are fully reconciled mm-hmm. later. But then she meets Turniped, who's one of my favorite characters. He's fun. Just this 
Scare- I like mute him. scarecrow that just tries to help. He's Ooh. sweet. He's a kind. He is dude. sweet. He's got a bad curse on him, but he's <laughs> sweet, right? Oh yeah. And then we get to the castle, and that's where we get Howl. So we get Howl, Markle, and Calcifer there, right? And as individual characters, they're all just kind of there. Yeah. They're just passive. They're just kind of doing their thing. But then we're going to see how all of them being in this castle pushes them forward. Now, one of my favorite scenes is when Sophie is cooking breakfast on Calcifer. Mm-hmm. And she's taking charge in the castle. And Calcifer has that great line, hope all your bacon burns. Yeah. yeah. So... Great cast, by the way, too. Like, just the voice cast, like, for the English dub. I think this is definitely one of my favorite. And Christian Bale is Howl. And this is actually where he found his Batman voice. Yeah, that's what I said when I was watching it. I said, oh, there's Batman Mm -hmm. voice right there. Yeah, that's where he finds it, right? That scene where he's the monster. Yeah. So, and it's funny because the English version of this movie came out the same week as Batman Begins. That is funny. obviously Batman Begins was number one. I think this was number like 13 or something like that. Hey, this movie didn't do this movie financially did not do well in America, that. but it gained like this weird critical status. Like I remember like in middle school, people were obsessed with this movie, mm-hmm. especially like in the emo subculture. Cause yep. everybody identified everybody with how loved how. Yep. Yep. You remember that too? Oh yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so there's the scene where they're cooking breakfast and breakfast meal scenes are never just about the meal. They're always trying to communicate something bigger. So we talked about in Fury, they're having a meal, right? And that's trying to expose this family, like this humanity family dynamic they're trying to have but can't, you know, past lives. They're having this meal at the bar Mm -hmm. where they're trying to figure out their place. And in here, it's the same thing. The meal is really about that line where Markle says, I don't remember the last time we had a meal like this. Mm -hmm. Sophie is bringing something vital to this family. It's not just breakfast. She's bringing a sense of order to them. She's bringing the feminine touch, which is something that all of Miyazaki's feminine protagonists really are trying to do. They're trying to have a healthy aspirational view of femininity and how how to bring that in, right? So she's bringing that in because she's also she's like a weird like mother grandmotherly figure, but she's also like a love interest too. So she's supposed the to be, yeah, mm-hmm. she is the caretaker archetype, yeah, exactly. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And at the end, she's like, I figure out how to help you. <laughs> yes. That line kind of made me mad. Because, th- <laughs> but that's all she wants, yeah. right? I mean, listen to the description here. So the, the caregiver really archetype motivates empathy, compassion, and a desire to help through providing comfort, nurturance, and practical assistance where it is needed. And in this way, to accomplish the caring functions needed for a human community to flourish. That's Sophie. That's her whole arc in the movie, right? Is to embrace this role. But in order to do so, she has to deal with her own curse. There's these moments where she goes back and forth between being yeah. old and being young. So what do you think is the out. significance of that? Well, I was wondering if, if the more she's in love, she starts to become young again, but there's times yeah. where she's sleeping and she's young. And there's mm-hmm. times I was wondering, there didn't seem to be any rhythm to it. Yeah. What do you think, Jason? I don't know, because I, I noticed that too, but it must be something including love, but also not exclusive to it. In her sleep, mm-hmm. she's free. She doesn't have, I don't know. because. When you're asleep, you're free of all emotions, right? Yeah. It's peace. Yeah. So maybe it's when she's at peace or, or I'm not sure. Well, I mean, I think it's a twofold. I think, yes, I think you're right. I think it's a love for Hal, but I think it's also a love and a peace with herself, right? Mm-hmm. Because even when she's old, she accepts that that's where she's at, but she doesn't fully accept herself yet. She accepts what she's supposed to do, but she doesn't accept who she is. Because again, that Eastern storytelling, we're looking inward, right? What is the internal conflict? And Sophie and Hal both are insecure about themselves. So that moment, one of my favorite moments when Hal, the hair dye, which by the way, very personal for me because that actually did happen to me when I was in, I think, 10th grade when I was 16. My hair, legit, I went in to get it dyed. It was supposed to be blonde. And it turned orange. That's really and I had a meltdown just <laughs> like Howl, 
where I was just like, I life is not worth. Living. Yes. <laughs> I was so insecure at that age. And when my hair got turned orange, I was devastated. That's Absolutely wrecked. I remember I would wear a hat when I went out because I just, just did not. Cut it all off. Well, I fortunately was able to get some of it cut off and then some of it, we were able to mm. fix it and get it blonde. But mm. that freak, I had a meltdown, like a huge freak oh, out. That's how it literally melted down. Yeah, he literally melts. And then he calls the spirits of darkness, which I think that image is fascinating. So we melt down in these moments of insecurity and, yeah. and all that. And there's no point in living if I can't be beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> there's a weird comedy to it. He literally but, put his own heart at risk. Yeah. But then he all, he puts the whole castle at yeah. risk because he calls the spirit of darkness. And I love that image of how your own insecurities, your own darkness can destroy the family around you if you don't deal with it. it. Yeah, And like it impinges on everybody else. So Sophie's like, I, I've never been beautiful. When she runs out of yeah. the castle and free and has that moment where she cries mm -hmm. that that this is my favorite moment in the whole film because i think this moment is so profoundly real in a way that fantasy like connects with reality so that moment when she's out there and she's crying cuz she's like i've never been beautiful before is that when turnip head comes and with the turnip, umbrella mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, cuz turnip, turnip head is that aspirational compassion and he subtly reminds sophie of what she's called to do so she gets connection with an outside force she can come and back then she can go back into the situation and deal with it level-headed. Right, I'm starting to like this movie a little bit. More. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so good, yeah, right? It is. I also mm. really like the way how <coughs> attempts to not just look, but act. Mm -hmm. So every time he's on screen, he's like charismatic, lighthearted, confident. The way he acts is just, he knows everything that's going on. and even Yeah, he looks way, like he has it all together. Yeah, even the way he says, that woman terrifies me. I need you to be there. Like, it's, yep. it's, it's not said with any, not necessarily weight, but like he's, I don't know if lofty is the right word. He's, he's very like bright about it. Yeah. And about the things he said. But, and I thought the scene where he's just in his room and it's just covered with all this magic. Yeah. And all this other stuff. And he's like, all oh, this magic is just to keep everybody away. I just run and run. Yeah. And he's got the knives and the stuff thrown into that contract on his wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way the the castle just kind of creaks and groans and it's bound to the ground. Yeah. Like it can it, go it up. It can't actually the, soar yet. It can go onto the mountains and you can walk really, really high up. And yeah. Calcifer is is really strong and it moves it moves the castle. It moves the rest, I guess, of of his body around. Right. But it's not until the end where the castle's flying now. And right. It looks cleaner. It doesn't look so clunky and noisy. Well, how would fall under the magician archetype? That's so, really funny. Yeah, it actually is a real archetype. But the mission, listen to, to what this is, though. And this is one of my main archetypes. So I relate a lot to Howl. And my wife is a, has the caregiver archetype. So we love this movie. This is like a staple in our house. Magician archetype motivates a powerful desire to infuse meaning and mattering into everyday life, mending what is broken, realizing dreams, and transforming what is into what could be. So that's what Hal is doing because Hal does have this vision for, for a better life. Now, he keeps, there's two opposing sides that are trying to draft Hal into the war, right? Now, what happens is that the wizards, when they go and fight, when they fight long enough, they start to turn in to these strange bird things. It's called a kotingu. It's a Japanese mythological bird that symbolizes overconfidence and arrogance and heading towards destruction. <laughs> Howl, every time he goes and fights in this war, and again, he's not trying to take a side. And this is something interesting about Miyazaki's male protagonists is they tend to have a hard time taking a side. And this is actually the magician archetype. One of the things it says is that they could see all sides of an argument. And so it can be hard for them to take a stand, which I relate to that as well. So with Howl, he just destroys the weapons of war, but doesn't want to destroy any of the people on any sides. He even has that line when they're in the garden yeah. and Sophie says, whose ship is it theirs or ours? And he said, what difference does it make? Like that's Howell's yeah. character there, right? That's how he, he treats this war there. 
And he but, doesn't he doesn't kill any of the people on it or destroy right. it. He just slows slowly it down. crashes it. Right. But every time he does that, every time he goes and fights, it gets harder for him to turn back human. He's that bird form is more a part of him to that point where Sophie tries to find him in the dark corridor and he's completely that monster bird creature, right? We see in that moment that that's what Hal can become. He can potentially become this creature of destruction. The war can do this to him. It can consume him. And so Sophie has to find a way to get him his heart back. That's another theme is this idea of a heart and as a burden. How, even though he has compassion, he's lost his heart. And that's what Sophie has to get back. Because if you're giving compassion, if you're just giving, 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 but your heart's not in it, then you're going to lose your humanity. And that's what Hal's at risk of doing. And so Sophie has to go and find the heart. And that's when she learns, which it's taken me a few times watching this film to figure out what the heck is happening. When Sophie is like going back in time and seeing, right? Childhood. His childhood. So Hal takes a shooting star and then <laughs> he eats it. Eats it. And then gets magic abilities. But the star becomes, like, takes his heart, though. Right. So Calcifer, you know, takes the heart in and of himself. And that heart, again, is what's keeping the castle alive. If you remove Cal Calcifer yeah, so and the heart, crumbles. the castle implodes. It crumbles. And so Sophie is able to, through her compassion within this setting, and she's able to, with Calcifer, get the heart back while also preserving Calcifer, which nobody was able to do. And this is where, you know, Sophie turns into this form where she looks young, but her hair is old, is gray, mm -hmm. right? So she's been able to reconcile them at this point, her youth, her beauty, but then also her wisdom and compassion become one identity. And I love that she doesn't completely yeah. Change back to being young. It's integrated. It's in, she's integrated. That's a good way of putting it. But but by her hair, that's the first time that Sophie's called beautiful in the movie by Hal. Yes. Hal says your your hair looks like starlight. It's beautiful. Yeah. And she's old when mm -hmm. when he says that. Yeah. In the garden. Yeah. yeah. And there's there's small like hints at at who she is and her compassion too. Like it's it's obvious in a lot of ways. But even in when there's the three utensils and there's two spoons and one fork. And what are you going to eat bacon and eggs with not a spoon? But that's what she takes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I still think it's interesting that he took on Markle as, a, as an apprentice to begin with. Like he wants family. He doesn't want to be alone. Yeah, I think Markle definitely shows that. And, and then I, oh, the way he's able to find a role for Turnip Head, even though he's like, mm -hmm. your curse is so bad. I don't know if I want to let you in the castle. <laughs> that's what he says. Yeah, right? This is too much. <laughs> this is too much. Because he recognized, like, it's all about carrying burdens. Howl's carrying these burdens of the people in the castle. Even his ex-girlfriend in a way, you know, <laughs> where he, he was like, That's I thought wild. she was beautiful, but she was really ugly, you know? And so I ran away. But so I ran away. He's just running away from everything, but he's learning how to carry those burdens. And even though Howl has all the magic, he's the most lost one. And even though Sophie, you know, is the one with the, the curse, she's the one who has the power to make the best of it and to be able to, Restore this family here. She speaks. She has the magic. Yeah, she has a different kind of magic, yeah. right? And then we get to the end where we realize that, you know, through so again, Sophie, by pulling this scarecrow out of a bush by that act of compassion of just helping this thing, then the scarecrow's along for the ride. Then she kisses Turnip Head. And then it turns out that he's the lost prince that the whole war is over. Madam Sullivan just mm. casually says, all right, let's just end this war. And Sophie's his long lost love, which isn't required, requited. And he's like, well, well we could, we can always count on the one thing that hearts always change. Yeah. That's what he says. At the yes. End. Yeah. And I mean, that's all better now. That's a lot of Miyazaki's. I'll war be back later for you. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of Miyazaki's war commentary in there as well is like, Oh, th this could just be called off at any time, but we choose not to. I like the president or the the king. Oh, yeah. Well, there's definitely some political jab. Like some people have theory that the king is and Madam Sullivan are supposed to represent like American politics. Like the king is Let's just kind it. of like derpy and kind of war hungry. 
Yeah, but when Hal pretends to be the king, she sees it's fake because Hal's trying to be all elegant and all that. And we see the real king, and he's kind of an idiot. I wouldn't say idiot, but he's just, like, not at all as poised. Or no, he's not impressive. We'll beat him to a pulp. Yep. <laughs> yeah, kind of George Bushy. Yeah. <laughs> Lots so in Toy Story 3. But yeah, but all, it's funny because they're ultimately trying to avoid this war, but then Sophie helping this scarecrow, it's low-key what ends the war there. Mm -hmm. So, and then they, the castle's able to soar. They're able to live together as a family. That's their colors change. If you look at their clothes in the final shot, they all are wearing different colors. The colors they were wearing versus what they wear, it's all signifying change. That's interesting. That that small act of kindness of helping Turnip Head in the beginning mm -hmm. is what ends the war. Right. He's saying just this little act can stop this huge thing. Right. So I don't know. Any other thoughts on this movie? There's a whole lot of symbolism. Yeah. It's layered. Mm -hmm. It's very layered. I think one of my favorite scenes is when Adam Sullivan and, and Sophie and Hal and the witch are all together and she does the thing where she taps her staff and like the the ocean comes out and it shows. Oh yeah, the That's scene so with cool. the with the fallen stars like dancing around. And how it becomes like the monster and she snaps him out of it. I just yeah. the, the the music and the imagery was just really cool and beautiful. I thought Mi that was Miyazaki's awesome. a master at really beautiful imagery and then also colliding that with really disturbing, haunting yeah. things. Another thing with Sophie in the end where she asks mm -hmm. the witch the waist for the heart back. Mm -hmm. And all she does is hug her and say, please. Yeah. And just her compassion or vulnerabilities. The with, empathy. Because yeah. she's like, I know how much this means yeah, to you. Just please. And she gets it. I thought that was a like a, a culmination of her character right there. Yeah. Well, every character is changed by the end of the film in some way. Mm -hmm. Sophie is able to you know, love herself love everyone, and love everyone. Hal's able to, same thing, right? Because Hal has that line where he says, like, I now have something worth fighting for. Yeah, you. Yeah. And then you've got even the Witch of the Waste is able to let go of her desire for beauty and youth. Her greed. And yeah, her, her greed. greed. Yeah, she gave something away that she, like, yep. put, wanted to possess. Yeah, everybody changed. Even Calcifer becomes, instead of being this confined to this thing and says, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that all the time, right? He's able to lift the castle. He's able to be outside the castle. And then he's finally able to just be free as is and not be bound to anything else. It's cool. That's, that's Sophie's interaction with Hal's heart <laughs> that we're seeing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On an archetypal like, level. Oh, yeah. She's like yeah. encouraging his heart and... When no, his uh, heart is free. When when he feeds her her hair, that he gets super strong and starts moving it. Mm -hmm. Like she, he was attracted to her hair, but and then she go and he goes. Imagine if you had given me your eyes or, or something else. What I, I could do. That's what Hal sees in Sophie, like mm -hmm. her eyes, her heart, her hair. Like that's what she, he sees well, as that's beautiful. What, that's what Hal needed was her hair, mm -hmm. the wisdom. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Her, her wisdom, the way she sees things, her eyes, her kind eyes, and yeah. her, her compassionate heart. This movie's deep. Yeah. Has it gone up a notch for you since <laughs> Soggy? No, it, does, it has. It has. I needed that. Yeah. Because it, on first watch, you can miss all of that. It's so mm -hmm. overwhelming, the visuals. Yeah. And this was the least overwhelming of his movies that I've seen so far. Yeah. So the, the pace, the structure, and the visuals can really... That could you could lose it. Well, I think that's it's why noisy. a lot of, a lot of people like to return to Ghibli films in terms of rewatchability. Is that there's so much you almost have to have a different kind of storytelling hat when you're watching it. Because again, I'm thinking more Eastern when I'm watching. I'm not judging it by a Western criteria, but also I'm looking at it very symbolically, as you should with any fantasy work. But Miyazaki, everything he's doing is so intentional symbolically. And so you have to really take the time to, to figure out what's all going on. But it's a great movie. And I think there's always a lot to talk about in these films. So I look forward to doing more in the future. If you want to do a deep dive more into the world of storytelling, get better understanding it, getting a craft of it, visit allthingsnarrative.com because we've got workshops that we offer, including a workshop that I did recently on analyzing films, talking about the hero's journey, talking about how do we analyze archetypes, symbolism, and stories. If that's a workshop that you'd be interested in, whether it be a group that you know, or whether you're in the Palm Beach County area and you want to do it in person, or you want to do something via Zoom, go ahead and check out the link here 
in the show notes and you'll see that you can actually fill out a little form just to tell us more about what you're interested in. And I'd love to get a a free consultation with you and see if you'd be interested in learning more about storytelling via these workshops. And we will be back next month for a new batch of films. And until next time, guys, take care. Thank you for listening to the Live a Meaningful Story podcast produced by All Things Narrative. If you'd like to learn more about our coaching, workshops, events, please check out allthingsnarrative.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at All Things Narrative. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and tune in next time as we continue exploring the stories we love and the stories we live. Take care.